What's going on guys? Josh here from Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And today we're continuing our series in the monomyth. If you have no idea what that is, go ahead and check out my other video where I did an overview. And I will leave a link down in the description below. But essentially the monomyth is the hero's journey or the fool's journey. And we see it in all kinds of stories throughout antiquity, all the way up until contemporary times. Several of the major blockbuster Hollywood movies are not necessarily based on the monomyth, but they follow it. So, again, check out that video if you want to see what's going on there. If you're, if you're, if you have been following, then you know that right now this will be video two on separation and just a really quick recap there are three main phases or acts to the monomyth the separation phase the initiation phase and the return we're in the separation phase in video one I talked about the purpose of the separation phase in here in video two what we're going to discuss now is what are the key steps that Joseph Campbell, Chris Vogler, and several other professors and mythologists throughout history have identified as the key components to the monomyth structure. And then the last video will follow up with what are the main characters that need to be introduced in the separation phase? So, with that out of the way, let's start talking. Let's get right into what are the phases, or what are the steps? So, if you imagine, here is the separation phase, here is the initiation phase, and here is the return phase. Separation is then broken up into little smaller steps. And kind of like if you were to view the United States, it says it's one big nation, but then if you break it up, you have the East Coast, the West Coast, and the, the middle, right? The center. And then if you were to break each of those up, then you have all the different separate states. This is the same kind of concept. So the first step that we see and I, again, I, I spoke about this before. You can look, you can look at prologues and hooks as sort of, sort of contemporary devices that that writers use now in order to help build that foundation for their story. But they're not necessarily part of the monomyth, and they they're not a necessity. What I will say is this. I have other videos on that topic, so you can check those out. Bottom line is, you can use them if you want. You don't have to use them if you don't want. But where the monomyth really starts is the hero in their mundane world. So the hero is normally in a place of the ordinary world where they live, they breathe, and we get to see them and the choices that they make to, in terms of how do they spend their free time? What job have they chosen as their profession? Or did they have a choice? Sometimes that's a big thing in this world building is showing that certain classes of people don't have a choice. And maybe that's what the journey is all about, is helping them make a choice for their own, as in terms of making their own life decisions. So, a lot about what you show in that beginning part will give the audience a glimpse into what kind of world you, do you have here. And one of the things that I failed to mention in my last video on the purpose is you want to set up, during the separation phase, you really want to set up the world rules. What are the rules, the technology, and all of this other stuff that the hero is going to interact with. And now that I think about it, I'll do a whole nother video on that. But the bottom line is you want to set that standard straight away so that again, kind of kind of like you, you won't expect 
a hero in in on a de on a desert island to have access to a machine gun. On the flip side, you don't expect a hero who lives in a spaceship to use bow and arrows. So those kind of rules you want to set up early, particularly when it comes to magic or things like magic, for example, the force in Star Wars or some sort of technology that seems like magic. You want to give a brief overview and then during the course of the story, then you can start developing it. So what does that look like? If you are doing a science fiction film or story and you want to start off with your hero kind of showing that world in their mundane, showing those rules in the mundane world, what you might have them do is interacting with the technology that they'll use. Or maybe show the villain using their technology, their super star destroyer or something to that effect to met, to terrorize someone so that now the audience has an idea okay this is what this is the kind of rules that I can expect these are the kind of people that that the hero is gonna face but in their ordinary world for example say you're on the Starship Enterprise in that ordinary world you can press a few buttons and a machine will create food for you and a teleporter can take you from point A to point B. However, if you look at Star Wars, that's a whole different, if they're both science fiction, but that's a whole different story world with a whole different set of rules. There is no teleportation. You use hyperdrive to go from one place to another. For those of you who are familiar with Mass Effect, they use the Mass Effect fields to go intergalactic travel. So there's so many different ways that you can use technology to set up your rules, but you just want to be clear, defined, and the, the key thing is don't change the rules on the audience later. If, if there's no, for example, if there's some sort of nanotechnology that you introduce halfway into the story, some re some readers, particularly hardcore science fiction fans, are going to say, why can't the hero use that same technology? So unless there's some reason that only the bad guy has the nanotechnology, like maybe they're a super evil scientist and they know how to make that technology, that might work. But if just out of the blue, he can he can use nanotechnology or he can teleport and the other one can't, it raises the question, why? Why don't those rules match anymore? So you want to you be careful there. But the, the main reason you want to set up the normal world, the ordinary world, is to, one, create some, some fidgetiness in the hero. There's something going on there that they, they, they're not necessarily comfortable with. And they they may, maybe they want to leave, but they don't think they can. Or maybe they, maybe they're really comfortable with where they are, but they need to leave. But you want to show like this is this is not healthy for the hero to just stay here. And then the next step. So we have the ordinary world. The next step, what we have is the call to adventure. Now, the call to adventure normally comes from a herald, and we'll talk about that. But essentially, this call to adventure is the main mission, or the initial mission, at least, where your hero in Matrix, it literally is a call, a phone call, a phone ringing that gets Neo, he picks up the phone and he hears a voice on the other end that tells him to jump, and then he can't do it. And then again, throughout the film, there, there are more calls to adventure, but the point is, that the call to adventure is it represents something that happens in all of our psyches where we know that we need to do we need to change our ways there's something we need to do differently but we're we are reluctant to do it because we're so comfortable in our normal world so a perfect example of this would be Luke Skywalker he's 
hanging out at Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru's farm. He's kind of miserable. He dreams about going into space and being part of the, you know, the, the rebellion against the Empire. But at the same time, when the call comes, when the droids come, they're the herald, and they give the the message to Obi-Wan and Luke at the same time, he immediately tells Obi-Wan he wants nothing to do with the mission. Because even though he, he in his mind, it seems nice that he could do that, he could do these great things, he really doesn't want to. And so this leads us into the next step, which is the refusal of the call. And they're sort of part of the, the same thing, but although sometimes there are heroes that will totally accept the call right away, a lot of times a hero will refuse it. And those heroes, a lot of times, are the ones that we really relate with. Because most people, when confronted with a situation where they can maintain status quo or do something different, choose to maintain status quo. Even though they know that choosing something to do different might be better for them, they, they refuse it. Now, another example we could use is Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games. There is this lottery system, and she knows it's coming. And the herald is Effie. She's pulling the names out of the hat. And the call to adventure actually comes to her sister, Prim, first. And the call to adventure is, you have to participate in the Hunger Games. And nobody wants to. Every, every single one of those people sitting there will want to refuse that call because they know it's deadly. It's dangerous. They're more than likely going to die if they get called to this adventure. However, so Katniss refuses that call up until the point her sister gets the call. And then she says, no, I volunteer in her spot. And this does two things. One, now we have the acceptance of the call, which every hero who goes on the journey eventually has to, whether out of desire or necessity. For Katniss, you could say it's a little bit of both. She doesn't want to go, but she her desire is to, to keep Prim safe. And it's out of necessity. There is no other choice, so she has to. The same thing goes, uh, if we go back to Luke, he initially tells Obi-Wan he doesn't want to go. But then when they find out that the stormtroopers have killed Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru, Luke realizes, one, this is personal. There, no one is safe, not even the innocent people like, like farmers like Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. And two, he realizes like he has nothing left. There's no, he has no other choice but to go out and try to make a difference so that this same thing doesn't happen to other people, to other innocent people. And there are several other examples of calls to adventure. I think The Hobbit is a very interesting one where Gandalf comes, the, the dwarves come, they, they tell him about this burglar job, and he's completely against it. And then he kind of sleeps on it, and he realizes that although he, it's going to be dangerous, he realizes that there's, there's some benefit to going out on a journey. He knows that he'll, he'll come back different, but he feels like it's worth the risk because he wants to see the wide world. And over the course of the, the story, we see Bilbo grow and develop as a person and a character until when he comes back, he's almost unrecognizable because he's no longer spineless. He has a backbone. So after the call to adventure has been accepted, normally the next step is going to be the the mentor. And mentor is a word that Chris Vogler uses in his in his book, the 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 writer's journey. However, in Joseph Campbell's book, 
the hero with a thousand faces, he calls it the supernatural aid. And specifically, he talks about the old woman or the old man, the Spider-Man, the Spider-Woman. And in a lot of the old stories from antiquity, that's who that was. And the reason is because, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more in archetypes, but an older person represented someone who had gone out, seen the world, done things, and obviously succeeded because they wouldn't have lived that long to be old had they not succeeded. So the way Chris Vogler kind of tweaks that and just says mentor is it doesn't have to be someone that's older. It can be someone who is the same age. It could be someone that's younger. It could be someone that's crazy. It could be someone that's not even a human. It could be a robot for, for all intents and purposes. The point is the mentor's job is to impart wisdom that will help the hero along the way and a lot of times this mentor will be the person who gives the hero not only advice but also some sort of trinket talisman weapon to go out and fight the the challenges that are surely ahead of them in the in the journey so if we look at Star Wars, one of the things that Joseph Campbell pointed out in his Power of Myth PBS special is that Obi-Wan gives Luke not only a lightsaber, which is a weapon to fight the dark side, but he gives him a psychological... O or oath order standpoint to go off of which is the 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 force and trusting in yourself and as the trilogy goes on we learn more about the force there's a light side and a dark side and and temptation and all of these other things but the mentor gives these tools some tangible some intangible for the hero to go out and succeed in their tests. And we see this again too in, in the Lord of the Rings. It's both a blessing and a curse that Frodo gets the ring of power. It gives him, it's something he is able to use in the, in, in his future challenges to stay alive and stay safe but it also corrupts him and this is a very interesting thing a note on these magical weapons in general is that it's sometimes good to show that this weapon is not always safe because that adds an extra layer of conflict in a lot of magic quote unquote like in a lot of fantasy genres stories narratives what they'll do is, for whatever magic you use, it depletes you. There is some sort of penalty on your energy or on others. You have to sacrifice something. And that's also a very interesting way to go because it helps create conflict. So, so if again, this is a lot of different phases, so I just want to go back. We're, we went from the normal world to the call the refusal of the call, to the acceptance of the call, to, to finding a mentor, or sometimes the mentor finds you, to receiving gifts, talismans, weapons for your journey. Now the next thing that's going to happen, or what has kind of should have been happening throughout ever since the hero was in their ordinary world, is they're going to come across Threshold Guardians. Now both the Herald and the mentor can start out as threshold guardians but as they progress they take on more defined roles we'll also see that some of the the other people that the hero comes in contact with such as rivals or allies and of course the villain themselves will appear as a threshold guardian and an example of a threshold guardian 
from the old stories would be an ogre standing at a bridge. So think of Dora the Explorer where you have the grumpy old troll who lives under the bridge, right? That is a, a perfect archetype of a threshold guardian. You have to defeat them in some challenge in order to pass into the threshold or to go further into the threshold. And what Joseph Campbell points out, and, and actually Chris Vogler as well, is that sometimes it's not necessarily fighting them or defeating them. Sometimes it's absorbing their energy, learning from them. And a good example of this would be Han Solo and Chewbacca. In Star Wars, they are they are initially kind of a rival. They're definitely a threshold guardian because Luke and Obi-Wan need some way out of the system. And the only real way is to find a cheap pilot that will be discreet about where they want to go. So... Over time, though, Han and Chewbacca become allies. And Luke absorbs them in the sense that he befriends them and he then gains their expertise, their knowledge, sometimes their buffoonery, also the Falcon and the ability to travel at, at light speed, all of these different things. So that's the Threshold Guardian. And then... One of the final stages in separation is the threshold itself. Now there can be multiple thresholds throughout a story depending on what kind of story you're telling and, and whatnot. And the, the more different that the normal world is compared to the special world, the, the, the more either the longer the thresh, the longer the threshold should be or the more thresholds you should have. So that each time they go through a threshold, the audience, feels like they're going deeper and deeper into this new world and they can see the compare and contrast between the two and a threshold in the Lord of the Rings at least for what from what Peter Jackson did I'm not I can't recall if it's in the actual Lord of the Rings that J.R.R. Tolkien did Samwise Gamgee they get to a point and he stops Frodo and Frodo's like what's wrong and Sam says, this is the farthest I've ever been from the Shire. And it's just to show that the hero is now in unknown territory. He's in a place that he has no previous knowledge of. So the rules could be a little different. The rules, things could get a little hairy. He's outside of his comfort zone. And normally this is also the place where you're going to go to what's known as the watering hole or the melting pot. And that is in many films, as Chris Vogler mentions, if you look at 100 films, roughly 75 of them will have a bar scene. Because a bar is such a perfect example of the watering hole. It's the place where people go to get information, to get sustenance but it's also a place where predators go to prey on the unlikely if you think about a real watering hole out in Africa in the savannah you have all of the gazelle and zebras come drinking from the water and then in the water you have gators ready to try to come out and sn snatch one of the, the the animals and then outside of the water you'll have lions or hyenas prowling around, ready to attack. It's that same aspect. There's a hint of danger, but this is where the animals have to go in order to get that which they need. It's the same thing when we look at a story. The hero must go to this watering hole, which is somewhere around the threshold, in order to obtain the information they need, the documents they need, the... the... the rite of passage through like in Star Wars so that's another that's another big aspect to think about and then lastly we'll, we'll end on the the belly of the whale so in Joseph Campbell in Joseph Campbell's book that I showed you earlier hero with a thousand faces 
he says that the final stage is where the hero faces death for the first time and comes out victorious. And it's very important to show the hero facing death because they it gives the audience this sense of danger and fear so that they don't feel that they know that the hero is not safe. It kind of raises the stakes. A good example of this is in Lord of the Rings where Frodo and his cousins, Merry and Pippin, go to the, I believe it's called the Prancing Pony, and which again is a watering hole. And they're surrounded by these giant men and everybody's drinking beer. And the, the nine, the ring wraiths, are hunting them down. And they just luckily stumble across Aragon, or Strider at the time, who hides them away before the ring wraiths come and and try to murder them in their sleep. For the audience, the audience doesn't know that they're not in their beds. And when the ring wraiths come to to kill them, everybody thinks that they're being murdered. That is that sense of death. Even if it's not a true death, it makes the audience feel at a at a point that the hero is in so much danger that they might or have died. Another example is Luke Skywalker. When they're in the trash compactor in the in the waste sector of the Death Star and they're trying to get out, the walls are closing in on them and they're well before that happens though, there's there's this murky water with trash and then there's this monster that grabs his leg and pulls him under the water. And that is a symbolization of death. And for a moment there, when Luke is underwater and he doesn't come back up, not only do Han, Leia, and Chewie think that he's dead, but the audience does as well. And then the monster releases him and leaves, and then the, the walls start closing in. And again, we get this sense of they're going to be crushed and, and killed. And it's a sense of imminent death. And... Throughout the story, you'll see that the hero will face death multiple times, but this is the first time that the hero will face death and then come out alive, come out uh, sort of reborn in a sense. So that about covers it. We're reaching 30 minutes, so I really need to stop here, but let's just really quick recap. For separation, the phases are you have your hero in the normal world then the hero gets a call to adventure from the herald then normally the hero will refuse the call but because they have no other option they eventually accept the call then from there the hero will come across a mentor or a mentor will find them and after that the mentor normally instills some sort of knowledge and gives tools, weapons to go along the journey. And then the hero is going to meet threshold guardians. Some of them are rivals, allies, and they're going to come across the threshold. Normally around this point, there will be some sort of watering hole or a melting pot where lots of different people are there. And it's your first glimpse into the special world. Then the hero will cross the threshold, and when they do, they'll enter their their first experience with death, which is the belly of the whale. Where even if the hero doesn't truly die, we believe that they die, or we believe that they're in imminent danger. The only time that that would be different, just as a side note, is if it's if it's a romance novel or something like that then it's not necessarily literal death, although it could be. Sometimes it's death of a relationship. They break up or something to that effect. So, we're almost at 30 minutes here. We'll cut off there. I hope you guys have found this interesting, entertaining, informative. And if you have, please give it a like. If you want to hear more, then please subscribe to my channel. And all of this information, all of these videos will ping you. They'll show up on your YouTube page as soon as I post them. But until next time, 
keep writing the good right. Take it easy.